Hi everyone, thank you for joining. My name is Danny, and today we're going to talk about how to fail fast and how this can be a great tool for you when you're building your next product or startup. So before we begin very briefly about my journey. So I've started in product management in 2007. I was working for a company called Time to Know, which later changed its name to Enably, and I was building products for educational technology market. Later on, I moved to Watchdogs, which was acquired by BlackBerry, where I was working on a portfolio of products in the space of uh, enterprise collaboration and secure communication. I was very interested in machine learning and natural language processing products. So at a later stage, I moved to Ginger Software, where we utilized machine learning and natural language processing technologies in order to build automated grammar correction uh, software, as well as voice recognition software, which was later on acquired by Intel. In 2014, I've joined as the CEO for Soluna Labs, which is a Silicon Valley-based technology incubator where I've incubated numerous companies from zero to one across multiple verticals, ranging from financial technology, enterprise collaboration, social networking, and more. And recently, I've joined Facebook where I work on machine learning products. So what are we going to discuss today? We're going to talk about failing fast and what that actually means how failing fast can help you drive success, how to do it the right way, and there are different considerations when you're working on a B2B versus a B2C product or a company, which potential biases might prevent you from failing fast and how to avoid those, and finally, how to take those learnings from failing fast and to pivot successfully. So what failing fast actually means? So, and how to do that? So failing fast basically means Optimizing for speed and execution in turn, instead of optimizing for the best product that you can ever build. Basically, it means launching your product to the market as fast as you can, testing it in the market, getting feedback on your product or your company, improving based on that feedback, iterating, launching that product or company again, getting additional feedbacks, and keep improving until you eventually succeed and reach the product market fit, which we will discuss later on. The reason it is so crucial is because the business landscape is very rapidly changing. There is always threat from new competitors, new emerging technologies that might replace your. And uh, there's also many external factors. You can think about COVID as one great uh, recent example, which really changed the way we collaborate and communicate uh, over video. However, uh, even before COVID, there is always external changes. Those can be government regulation, demographic changes, political changes. Any of those can influence the needs of your customers, can make your product redundant or no longer needed if you launch it too late. So failing fast means really prioritize to launch good enough product and to optimize for speed. So what happens when you don't fail fast? Well, when you don't fail fast, you fail slow. And when you fail slow, you die. Kodak is a great example for that. Kodak was really a leader in the space of photography. However, the market was rapidly changing towards digital transformation. Kodak failed to embrace those rapid changes and to act upon them. And eventually, this ability of lack to respond to market needs got them to fail for bankruptcy in 2012. So now let's talk about a few examples how failing fast actually drive success. So very well known example is Rovio, which launched Angry Birds, which was a huge hit. However, not many people know that before succeeding with Angry Birds, Rovio actually launched 51 different games and none of them became a hit. And they were able to keep iterating, learning from their mistakes and eventually launch Angry Birds, which became a huge hit and the rest is history. Disney is another great example. Disney actually failed fast numerous times through his career. So in the early days when Walt Disney himself set up his own studio called Lafogram, he failed and after two years, basically had to file for bankruptcy. He picked himself up took the learnings from his mistakes, went to Hollywood, implemented those learnings into a company which we now, now all know as Walt Disney Studios. In the recent years, Disney had additional threat from competitors as well as from the changing market landscape, 
what people start to consume a lot of content via streaming with emerging companies such as Netflix gaining more and more market share. Disney was able to respond quickly to develop Disney Plus and to position itself already among market leaders in video streaming content. Some examples from the companies where I work for. So Enably, uh, for me time to know, started as a company which developed educational technology for schools, basically K to 12 market. It was very hard progress and uh, we quickly learned that selling to schools is very difficult. The decision-making process is very difficult and the needs are very distributed. However, the company was able to develop really great core technology for distant and, lim and remote learning. The company then pivoted and took that technology into the enterprise world and now providing solutions to large enterprise companies, helping their employees to work and learn remotely. Ginger Software is another great example. Ginger developed core technology around natural language understanding using machine learning and NLP technologies. Initially, that technology used to power grammar correction products. However, grammar correction products market became very competitive with new competitors emerging and uh, threatening Ginger in that market. So Ginger leveraged that technology to develop additional product line, which was voice recognition technology. And eventually that voice recognition technology was acquired by Intel. So how do we fail fast the right way? So before discussing how we fail fast the right way, it's important to understand the goals for failing fast. And those goals are different for your pre-launch stage of your product or company and the post-launch stage. Before you launch your product or company, there are a few things that you want to achieve. You want to quickly validate the feasibility of your product before you even start building it because you want to make sure you're actually investing your time into building the right product. You want to validate that the problem and the need is real and it's big enough and worth solving. If you solve for a very small customer segment, your company might never be able to make money out of that product and will still go bankrupt. Eventually, you also want to validate the business and the market landscape as well as the competition. You definitely do not want to build a product in a highly competitive market where similar solutions already exist unless you really have a very unique edge which nobody else has. After you launch your products, your goal uh, is different. You want to very quickly validate the demand or the growth or your top line goals for the product to make sure the product is now successful. You want to validate what works and what's not in your product. In many cases, your product might be uh, highly adapted. However, not all of the product features might turn out to be useful. So you really want to understand what's really driving your success. Finally, you want to understand why things not always work the way you have expected. Maybe your product did not pick up. Maybe it did pick up, but not with the market segment that you expected. So you really want to analyze those things in order to further improve your product and value proposition. So how do we fail fast for B2B products? So before we launch the products, there are a few things that we want to do. We want to get feedback. Feedback is critical. You want to talk to your customers. You want to show them prototypes of your products. Those prototypes can be as simple as paper drawings. You want to ask them the right questions and to see if you can get a commitment to buy. Successful ideas and successful products often able to get commitment to buy or even LOI, letter of intent, from customers before that product even exists. It is hard to get LOIs and you will not always be able to do that, but you should definitely gather feedbacks and build your product only if those early feedback validate your initial assumptions about the need. You also want to explore the competition. Who else is building a similar product? Even if nobody else is building a similar product, what other players in the market that has the capability to quickly be able to do that? Let's say you're building a video product and you might have a really great idea. How hard it is for Zoom Microsoft or other players in that landscape to catch up with you and to launch something very similar or even uh, more successful than your product in a very short time. That can be a significant threat for you and should really get you evaluated if it's worth investing in that product. 
Do you have any unique edge over those competitors? Do you have any unique technology which they cannot launch as fast as you? You want to get data. How many businesses really need that solution? What's the market size? Even if a few customers told you, hey, you know, we really like your product. We would really need that. Is that representative of overall market share? Will you be able to sell it to 10 different companies, 100 different companies, 1,000 different companies? What is your real addressable market? And finally, time to market is really the key. You should ask yourself, how soon can you deliver a good enough product to the market? If you know ahead of time that you will be too late, it's not worth building that product because others will beat you to the market and you will probably won't be able to get much market share. Let's say you've done all your homework and you're now launching your product. There is a lot of uh, validation and potential failures after you launch your product. Basically, you want to look uh, for product market fit. Product market fit is, is that interaction between the needs of the market, the uns which is unserved needs of your users and the target customers, and the features of your product. Those features can be the UX of the product, different functional features of your product and the value proposition. So things that you should ask yourself and you should investigate. Did you meet your sales forecast? Sales is basically a very direct indicator for the success of your product. If you had certain forecasts and you were not able to bid those, um, what is the real reason behind that? Why did you fail? Even if you did sell, it does not mean that your product is a huge success because selling does not guarantee engagement. Maybe some companies purchased your product, but nobody's using that. And those companies will then not renew the license for that product in the next year to come. So you should really check, do customers actually use that product? How often do they use that product? Will they really renew the license that you want them to renew next year? Finally, you want to really look for that product market fit. How do you prove product market fit? Well, it's a very hard question. Uh, some potential directions can be, can you show enough live referenceable customers? What does it mean referenceable customers? Do you have enough customers that purchased your product, used your product, and willing to give very good reference about you to potential new customers, which will help you sell your product further on? And those customers should be still using your product. Those cannot be customers who used to use your product, but no longer using it. Because that means basically that you failed with them. How does it all work in B2C? So B2C is a bit different. Uh, instead of launching to large customers, you're launching directly to mass consumer market. When launching directly to mass consumer market, the pre-launch considerations are different. First and foremost, you want to develop some hypotheses. Who will benefit from your product the most? Which user segment are you launching your product to? Are you launching for teens? Are you launching for adults? In which countries are you launching that? In which languages are, will your product be used? You want to back your hypothesis with data. Do you have data from the market that supports your hypothesis? Are similar products being successful in, in similar markets? Do you have data from previous iteration of your product, which uh, you're now trying to improve on? You should also try and test the demand. There are many companies that try and test the demand before they even launch any actual product. I don't know how many of you uh, had the chance to see those coming soon pages, where basically you get some announcement about very exciting upcoming product. You can uh, sign up for getting notified about the launch of that product. And that's, that's basically a validation, right? Because basically what the company does, in many cases, the company have, haven't even started building the product. However, by creating this huge wait list, A, it triggers interest in the product, which makes it easier to launch later on. B, it provides the company very solid validation of the amount of interest around that product before even investing into anything specific. Finally, Time to market is the key in B2C as well. And the sooner you launch, the sooner you'll be able to improve your product and the sooner you'll be able to take those learnings to launch a better product to the market. 
So what happens in B2C after you launched your product? After you launched your product, you want to keep iterating and improving it further. Usually products do not succeed in day one. And even if you had some partial success, you want to keep improving your product to really stay on top and really keep helping your users with their changing needs. The way you do it is by designing A-B tests. You would want to try and raise hypotheses about what you think that works and does not work in your product. You want to isolate those things and to test them. So for example, if you think some change in the UI of your product might make it, might make it better, let's say your product uh, is doing a uh, credit card transaction processing, and you think that just rearranging the fields of the credit card data might make the user experience more simplified, you would then create two versions of that product. You would launch them to two groups in a random sample and you would test which groups uh, reacts better to the product and which group derives more value from the product according to the metrics that you define. You should really try and isolate and test only one or very few variables at a time, because otherwise you will not know which of the variables that you changed in your product actually contributed to its success or failure. You want to really go deep and analyze the data of those results and really understand what drives the difference and the success of one variation of the product versus the other. You want to keep following up and run additional tests to better understand the outcomes of your product. In some cases, you also want to follow up with user research where you would go and implement more uh, qualitative methods and go interview users and ask them follow-up questions to better and deeper understand their motivations of using your product. Finally, similar to B2B, you always have to look for the product market fit. However, unlike in B2B, it's not about reference customers because you're launching to the mass market. So you should really think what are your like, top line metrics that can validate the success of your product. Those metrics can be around engagement. How high is the engagement of users with your product? How much retention do you have? Are users churning from using your product very rapidly? Or do they stay, retain, and keep deriving value from your product over time? Increasing those kind of top line metrics would show high value from your product and would indicate potential product market fit. So what potential biases uh, you should be aware of when thinking about failing fast? <clears throat> so there are numerous biases and I will mention only a few of them here. So one of them, I call it the quadrant bias. Um, many of you might know this kind of uh, quadrant where basically you position yourself against other companies across two parameters. And ideally you want to show that you are the leader among others who are challengers, niche players, and visionaries. However, those parameters and those uh, kind of analysis can be easily manipulated in order to make sure that you will stay on top. You can always think about two parameters which make your company stand out over the others. However, you should really ask yourself, are you, are you being true to yourself? Are those parameters really the important ones in your industry? Did you downplay competitors just to make you look good, but there is no real substance behind that? Your goal is to be very objective. If you're not the leader in your market, it's better to know it right now, to iterate, to try and improve or to pivot versus lying to yourself, thinking that you are the leader and eventually failing slow. The next bias, which is kind of related is the market analysis bias. There are numerous ways to do market analysis. Some people doing SWOT analysis of strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Others using the portal and market analysis, which is basically looking at the competitive rivalry in an industry, as you can see in the chart here. Uh, but there are many other ways. When you analyze the market, you should really ask yourself, are you being objective? Did you really explore all the different external factors the competitors and the overall ecosystem? Did you really validate the demand? Or, or did you just base the demand on some very sh small survey or very small sample of uh, feedback that you got from some potential customers? Are you aware of the real strengths of your product or are you just trying to position your product in a good way? 
failing to do really proper in-depth market analysis is a failure to understand the market and is a failure which will cause you to fail slow, to launch your product, not to see why it's failing and eventually that product will probably not succeed. Then there is the feedback bias. So you went ahead and start collecting customer feedback because you really want to validate your product or your idea or your company. But did the customers really tell you the truth or did you just document what you wanted to hear from them? Did you ask the right questions? Maybe the customers just wanted to make you happy and want, wanted to avoid confrontation. So they just gave you this kind of shallow answers to your questions. Um, did you lead the customer when you were asking questions? Or did you ask very open questions uh, which would really allow the customer to share any frustration that they might have from your product? Was the feedback really deep or was it shallow and not really get to the root cause? And by shallow, I mean customer would say, yeah, well, I really like that product, but why do you like that product? What in that product really makes it tick for you? Why is it better from other products that you used before? Or, you know, customer might say, well, you know, no, it's not a great product. Nice, great, good feedback, but why? How can that product be improved? Is there something specific that's missing in that product? If you're not asking the right questions, you will not get the right answers. And the feedback that you'll get will be biased and will lead you to take the wrong decisions. Finally, you want that feedback to be really actionable. You want to act on those recommendations. If there are features missing, you want to be able to know what's missing to build those features. If there are unneeded features or noisy features, you want to be able to know that and to remove those. Then there is management bias. Uh, management bias basically means, well, you know, I've built that product just because the management thought it's a really good idea. Well, that's probably one of the worst things that you can do, right? I mean, did you validate that idea? Did you, did you really do the due diligence or did you just trust the management decision? As a product manager, even if you're not the final decision maker, it's your responsibility to do the due diligence. The management might push for certain product decisions, but it's up to you to validate the data behind those decisions. Are those decisions really backed by data, by usage, by feedback, or those are just management hypotheses which was never tested before? So it's very important to be really objective about those things. And both for management and for yourself, not to be in love with your product. The fact that you invested time in your product or maybe money in your product, doesn't make it a good product. Sometimes it's more important to be objective, to understand that that product needs to be further improved or even changed than you know, keeping banging your head against the wall with the same product that's just failing. There are also statistical biases and there are much more than the ones that I've mentioned in here but I will highlight a few of those. So statistical biases are mainly biases which happen when you do different A-B tests. And there are many ways to fail with A-B tests. One is just misinterpreting the results. So you see some kind of a trend. So basically you compare between two groups and you see that one group uh, engagement is trending higher. Trending does not mean that the result is statistically significant. If the result is not statistically significant, it basically means that the group does not outperform your control group. As such, you should not take any decision based on trends and look for statistically significant results. There's also seasonality effect. Sometimes when you launch the product during specific season, summer versus winter, uh, work days versus holidays, etc., people will react differently to your product. You might think it's because of the attributes of the product, but those are actually might be external effects due to seasonality. There are also biases uh, around sampling. You, you really want to make sure to use random sample, which might be the best representation of your general population. By not properly selecting and allocating your sample, you might create a bias by testing the product with a very unrepresentative uh, part of the population for which the product might really work. Let's say you would test it for uh, elderly uh, people, 
However, you're looking to launch for the broader population. And for elderly, your test would show really great. But once you actually launch it for the overall market, it will fail big time. There is also regression towards mean. What it means is basically that over time, results tend to regress toward, towards the mean. So you launch an A-B test, and just after a few days, you see really promising results when one group outperforming the other, and it's even statistically significant. You need to make sure you, you run your test over long enough period of time. Because if you look after some more time, let's say, Instead of looking just after a few days, if you would look at, let that test run a few weeks and you would check the results, uh, you might just find out that those initial promising results and differences that you saw uh, actually regress to the mean and now the two groups performing exactly the same. There is also external factors or a history effect. Those factors can be uh, failures that caused uh, to your text uh, to your test or data interpretation just due to external factors. Servers failure. So let's say you launch a test and during certain period of time, uh, the server didn't work well. That can completely mess up your results. And finally, novelty effect. So sometimes when you launch something new, people respond to it just because it's new. So you should really be careful and really let the test run long enough to make sure that the positive or the negative results that you see are not there because users just responded to the fact that it's new, but are consistent over time with users responding to the fact that it's different and it's something substantial. So we got to our last uh, part of the presentation, which is pivot. Pivot basically means change in, the, in direction as a result of the learnings that you got due to failing fast. So when do we pivot? Uh, we pivot when a specific part of the product brings very high value, but other parts do not. So we might want to focus only on that part. We also pivot when the response from the market, those can be your B2C users or your B2B customers, is not what you expected. And you might need to change your product or your business direction. You can also pivot when you just can't beat the competition. The competition is just too strong and you're deciding that you should do something else where you have more competitive advantage. You pivot when you have no potential return on investment. So you might have a great product, but as I mentioned before, let's say the market is not big enough. So no matter how great your product is, there is just no way for you to become profitable. In such case, you will not be able to sustain that product or company over time, and you would want to consider a pivot. And finally, sometimes during your journey, you just discovered some different customer needs, which might be completely different from what you were looking for. However, by discovering those, uh, you found an opportunity which might be much bigger and much better to you, for you to focus on. And in such cases, sometimes it's worth to pivot uh, and to address that opportunity because that opportunity can yield much better results. So what are a few key takeaways that uh, I want to leave you with uh, from today's presentation? The first one is that failing is not a bad thing. Failing actually means learning. And if you fail and you learn from it, it will only make you better and it will only contribute to your success later on. Success is also not an automatic or given thing and it does not happen overnight. Success usually is a result of ongoing iterations and improvements. Biases is something that can really prevent you from failing fast and from learning from your failures. You should really be objective, true to yourself. Be very critical when evaluating data in order to try and avoid those kind of biases. Pivot is a very important strategy to think about when you have learnings from potential failures. It's much better to pivot and to take new direction, which can be much more promising versus just bending your head against the wall and keep doing the same thing over and over again. Finally, your knowledge and your learning from your failures is, your, is a very powerful toolbox that goes with you and helps you pivot and success later on. This is the end of the presentation. So thank you for listening and I wish you a lot of success in building your new products or companies.